Oh, it's she's totally messing up it. your hair, dude. <laughs> <laughs> Our guest today has spent the past 15 years making award-winning natural history and science programs for National Geographic. He travels all over the world, but he and his family make their home right here in Albemarle County. Join us as we catch up with filmmaker, producer, and director Jeff Luck. Come on! So you started out as a professor, an art professor, right? Yeah, so uh, how'd 15 you, years. 15 years, so how'd you find your way to filmmaking? You know, I'd studied film in college and that's what I'd been teaching. And then uh, when my wife got into grad school in New York, I realized that it was gonna be really hard to try to be a teaching guy in New York again. I'd tried that before. So I started um, freelancing, as a, mostly as, a, as an editor at that point. I was a cameraman and editor, and then I started editing and that sort of targeted, you know, places like Geographic or Discovery is where I wanted to end up. And then you did. Then I did, yeah. And you did. And you, you all started in New York, went to D.C., and you could really probably live anywhere. Why are you here, Charlottesville? Um, there's really, there was no reason for us to live here. It was kind of, um, <laughs> it was, no, there really, I mean, it, it, we've had to actually make a lot of sacrifices to do it. We just loved it and sort of thought, thought it would be a great place to raise kids. We just had a little baby and that's what I mean we had this little baby girl who was born in in Brooklyn and we were like no we thought we'd have a little hipster downtown baby and then we're like no we want to get out to the woods and yeah. out to, you know uh. all right so let's talk about your work what is your focus what what would you say is your main theme well I mean since since I've been at, at, at geographic and, and beyond for the past whatever 12 15 years it's mostly in natural sciences and science and and natural history you know, uh, animals, the environment, um, evolution, biology. But I've also done things on topics from, you know, nuclear physics to Afghanistan. But most of the stuff I do is, is wildlife, wildlife related. Uh, give, us, give us a few examples of some of the more interesting projects you've done over the years. Favorites or what you think other people would find interesting. For me personally, some of it has to do with where you go. Some of it get, you know, just the personal satisfaction of that. And some of it is the subject matter. Mm -hmm. um, I think those two came together for me in a way that was pretty special. I got to uh, make a, a, an hour long special about uh, Darwin, about the origin of species. Like that was amazing. Just to read the original Darwin, to then go where he went and through South America and Galapagos and Tahiti and New Zealand and, and, and see what were the many influences, not just the finches that led this young 23 year old guy to figure this out. Right. Um, probably the hardest shoot I've ever done and one of the, the films I'm most proud of, we did in Easter Island um, where we followed a caving expedition that was looking, it's a volcanic island, so there's all these caves throughout the giant lava tubes and all this crazy stuff inside and they were looking for signs of the past civilizations and, and, try, and so we followed them and sort of told the history of the island, which was basically the Lorax on steroids. Right, yeah. right. Just give us a little tea oh, for I, well, our viewers. The long story short is yeah. that they, um, the, the Polynesians, who were these incredible seafarers, found their way to what was still is the most uh, remote inhabited spot on Earth. And then they started chopping down the trees to help make these giant moai, these massive statues, the, the heads of which we see, but actually two thirds of which are below the ground now, most of them, they're giant. And, um, and move them around. And by the time they kind of realized it, um, they had chopped down or lost all the trees to rats that they brought, and they marooned themselves. Right. And they got stuck on the island, and they started, like, having, they fought and had cannibalism, and then they figured out like, a way to make that, to survive. And it's just this incredible story. So it's, it's being able to kind of, you know, dig in as a professional neophyte, you know what I mean? Like, I... I'm not an expert on any of this stuff. I, I, I sort of either get assigned something or I come up with an idea, and then you get to research it. And right. you, you call people up, you read all the books, you, you learn about it, and then you get to go to these places and, and learn about something new. And since the world is so kind of vastly inexhaustible yeah. in terms of how yeah, interesting it is, you know, you, wow. you, you know, there's always something new. You wear a lot of different hats you have throughout the years. You've worn the hat of filmmaker, producer, director, writer. Talk about those different roles and which you like best and, mm. and sort of the evolution for you of, of how you've, you've gone through, where you started and what you do now. For me, you know, I kind of went from 
the academic realm where I kept working primarily with the camera or as an editor to then becoming you know, a director and a producer uh, to then actually executive producing where I was overseeing whatever, 25, 30 hours of TV a year mm -hmm. and kind of looking at it strategically as, as part of a network. And now I've kind of come full circle and um, I'm, I'm directing, but I'm also fi I'm shooting again, I'm editing again, and oh, I've, that's great. I'm getting my, ha my hands are dirty in the projects again. And, and I, I'm happiest this way. I, I really like doing fewer things and just focusing on it for a year or, or two if it takes and, and just kind of doing it with my hands again. I could find a way to feel energized by what I do as opposed to having that energy pulled out of me. And that happens sometimes. That happens with everybody. Right. And, and in the arts, there are different projects that you do that, that you did one on urban wildlife, yeah. which um, is really interesting, mm -hmm. but it was tricky too because... Yeah, it was tricky. Well, it was tricky because, you know, I'd, want, want, I'd wanted to do it for many years. I've been pretty astonished to see how, how wild creatures have been making their homes in suburbia and in the heart of cities. You know, we followed yeah. coyotes um, in the middle of the polar vortex, if you remember that from a couple years ago, 40 below zero, in the downtown Chicago. There's no part of Chicago that doesn't have coyotes living in it, not passing through, but living there. Um, some of them never leaving the loop, you know, the downtown. And we, found, we were filming them hunting um, rabbits at 40 below zero, <laughs> with the streets empty, with the, the sirens going, you know. And, and so this is, I wanted to celebrate this and then was given sort of a, a edict to make it scary. And we tried to walk the line between letting people go like, what's going on and trying to be celebratory. But that was, that was frustrating when you kind of face some of the politics that can come up. Well, and talk about this, the great project that you did in Africa on African ele elephants. That story, talk about that. Um, I mean, this is where, you know, my whole family, up, we uprooted ourselves, we moved to Amsterdam, where the production company was based. Um, so that was an adventure in itself. And then I spent probably a quarter of the year in Botswana filming this incredible herd of elephants and the men who look after them, this group of basically misfits and orphans that have been uh, rescued and then given sort of a second chance. Uh, circus elephants, you know, the, right, the, the, right. The, the calves from culls when they used to think that they had elephant population problems, they'd go out and kill all the, the adults and these are the calves that were left over you know, 20 years ago. And, and so there's a, this camp where they, uh, they rescue them and they, they help them to rewild eventually. And so this little baby elephant was born there and tragically her mother passed away from natural causes about six weeks after she was born. So it, fell to these men she gives up to try to save her life. And that's the story of the film, is these incredible guys who just, to this day, are feeding her and looking after her 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We have to save our elephants one at a time. Every elephant counts. It changed your perspective. It, it did, Talk it about really that. did. You know, I mean, I've been very lucky to meet a lot of different creatures, chimps, wolves, great white sharks over the years, and I've been moved by them and see them all as being a lot smarter and a lot more as individuals and variegated. Like, that's a nice shark, that's a troublesome shark, this is a, that's a, that, that wolf is kind of timid, but to experience that with elephants the way I was able to, to be so close to them and to to see the, to experience their sentience. And that's really the best word I could use. They are thinking, feeling beings, you know, with a, with a society that I frankly think is every bit as complex as ours. It's astonishing what they're able to do. They, can, they could peg us based on the language we speak and know which language means you're more dangerous or whether you're male or female or whether you're old or young. I mean, they're yeah. watching us and they're yeah. responding to us and they're reacting to us all the time to try to survive because they have to. Yeah, that's so. See now, people, people are sitting here thinking, "Oh, he has a dream job. This is the dream job." Mm -hmm. And you would probably say, "Yes, <laughs> it absolutely, is my dream job." I mean, it, 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 it wasn't something I thought I would do when I was, a, you know, I mean, when I was a little kid, I would have loved to do it, and then I kind of forgot about it. And it certainly is has become a dream job for me. But it's, you know, but that's not by accident, and that's also not without cost. So that's what I you want to what talk I mean? about too, because you have this beautiful family. When you go away, how long are you gone usually? I tend to be gone for maybe three weeks at a time, a couple times a year. 
with Nalady in those films, there was more. I was probably, you know, and for the Darwin film, I think it was, I was probably gone overall for about a month and a half. But it's trying to, cr trying to find that balance and work together as a family so that, um, so I could be there to support her when she's like directing a show at Live Arts or something. Right. And, and, or that then she can, you know, take the ball when I've got to go off on a trip or, and that the kids, I mean, they have to, they step up too to, well, and, to and handle themselves. How do you transition? That's, you must feel for a few days like, who am I, where am I? I think part of it is that I simply feel home at this point. I've lived here longer than any place I've ever lived in my life. Oh, and wow. I mean, when Brie and I met, I pretty much lived out of my car. So <laughs> I, I settled down. <laughs> um, so I, things I, have changed. Yeah, that's things good. have changed. But, <laughs> but so I, I think there's also that's feeling part of a community. I mean, I almost always go straight to Dr. Ho's and, and sort of just ground here in the community and sort of in the kind of the quietude of the house for a couple of days, just to the family itself. You know, that, and, and, and Bree's always saying when I come back, oh, you, I can tell you've been hanging out with boys. You know, like <laughs> evidently my, my energy, my cadence, on the floor, I, whatever right? it is, I'm, I'm just <laughs> acting differently. You know, I, I kind of have to kind of settle down and, and kind of, you know, get in the domestic groove again after having been out there being silly. With the boys and the elephants. Yeah. So what Not are you working boys. on? No. What are you working on now? You've got some exciting projects. I'm, I'm really lucky. Um, Geographic has asked me to come back, and I'm working with them on, on several different film projects. One is a, a, a film about the uh, the impact of climate change on the Inuit in Nunavut and Greenland, uh, mm. the, and this area that 40 years from now scientists predict is going to be the last area in the Arctic with sea ice. Oh, wow. where it's the last place it's going to be and how they want to protect that area now because it's incredible it'll be where it'll it'll sort of be the Serengeti of the north where like this is the one spot left where narwhal and polar bear and all those things that depend on the ice will be able to survive and then now I'm prepping right now to to head to Gabon because it's it's the largest intact portion of equatorial rainforest in Africa hmm. and it and it has the largest population of, uh, of forest elephants, which are a separate species than the savanna elephants. I've been filming, all last year I did savanna elephants, and now I get to go do forest elephants, and, and we're profiling the people who are trying to save them there. Well, this is fascinating, hanging out with you. Thank uh, it's you. It's awesome, thanks so much. It's, it's so great to spend some time with you.